Most people don't know this, but there's a brain structure called the anterior mid cingulate cortex. What's interesting about this brain area is that there are now a lot of data showing that when people do something that they don't want to do, like adding more exercise or resisting eating something, when people do anything that they, and this is the important part that they don't want to do, it's not about adding more work. It's about adding more work that you don't want to do. This brain area gets bigger. In many ways, scientists are starting to think of this part of the brain as not just one of the seats of willpower, but perhaps actually the seat of the will to live. Welcome to my new podcast. Uh, this is the show where I will just read Andrew Huberman quotes for an hour or so at a time. No, um, I do love Andrew Huberman. But uh, he has informed the start of this. Uh, the rest of this is just my thoughts out to the world. So why start there? Um, I actually, I considered how to start this podcast for a while. Uh, much of it was just me procrastinating. But uh, I really, I wasn't sure how to start this. You know, I've done podcasts before, sports betting and um, I had a podcast a long time ago where I just talked about whatever nonsense came to mind at uh, any given week. So, you know, I could have just done something like that. I could have had a guest for this first episode, but what it really came down to, and it, you know, this, this quote from him kind of summarizes it. I figured if I'm going to do a podcast about quote unquote, doing hard things, I, felt like the most honest way to do that would just be to do the podcast in the most difficult way that I could do it and just start from there. So no guests to buffer the episode, uh, just me talking to the camera by myself for an indefinite amount of time. And as far as the topic, yeah, I mean, it would be very easy for me to just recreate all of the fun and turmoil of my sports betting career. But that is not nearly as interesting to me as, you know, the stuff that I really want to talk about. When I first started to get into the whole world of self-improvement and personal development, I didn't really have the perspective to apply it in more than just a handful of ways. Um, I think I've always understood that doing things that are difficult is important. Um, you know, I think my childhood of playing every sport imaginable uh, at a moderate level, medium level for most of them. But, uh, you know, childhood as an athlete, quote unquote, <laughs> I think, you know, you learn that practice is important and you learn that when you actually apply yourself more and more, you get better at things. I think that's kind of, you know, the main thing it teaches you when you, no matter how good or bad you are, you, you know, you can improve skills and you get that from playing, you know, being an athlete of any kind. So I think I've always understood that from a young age. And then in my twenties, I got more into working out and, you know, obviously weightlifting causes muscles to grow. You kind of see the benefits of that, but I don't feel like that was really applicable to the rest of my life. I didn't see it as applicable to the rest of my life at that point. It was just, you know, it seemed like these are isolated areas of life where you put in effort, you get better at something. And uh, that's just kind of it. I didn't really apply this to psychology very much. I didn't really think in those terms. And then I guess I'll just start here. So I got pretty sick in 2019. And this is really what gave me the perspective to whatever extent I have it. This is what gave me perspective that I have now. Um, I understood in theory that, you know, certain things like eating healthy and doing cold exposure and intermittent fasting and whatever else, like there were tools that people could use to make themselves healthier. Um, and I had sort of dabbled. I did keto diet for a few months. It was okay. Uh, I, I tried a bunch of stuff. I was kind of experimenting on myself, 
but there was a little bit where I just liked the challenge and there was more of it where, you know, I just, I was in a phase where I didn't have a, I wasn't working a nine to five. I just, you know, I was in a phase of just trying things and I had started to develop a liking for just self-experimentation and a liking for taking on challenges of whatever sort. But uh, yeah, the extent of it was, you know, limited. And then in September of 2019, during a period where I thought, just to give context, I thought I had real problems at this time. Um, I basically, what it was is I didn't like my social life that much and I didn't have a job. And that was really it. I was healthy. And for anyone hearing this, who's in this situation where, you know, you have problematic things going on, but you feel good generally. I mean, you, you can't know it until you know it. Like you can understand, yeah, yeah, you know, life could be so much worse. But until you actually feel that, it doesn't really mean much to just theorize about it. So I got hit with something complete. I was blindsided, just completely out of nowhere. Somewhere around August of 2019, I just started feeling a little bit tired. But, you know, people go through phases like that. I was just... It, arguably it was mental. You know, I was in this rut, as I was saying, and I didn't really think much of it. Uh, I don't know. The doctor thought I had been drinking a little too much and maybe I was just hung over all the time. I don't know. I don't know how <laughs> in hindsight, that conclusion makes no sense, but uh, this is what I thought was going on. So I was with my parents in Spain in September of 2019 and the first two days there felt pretty normal. Um, I was distracted from, you know, most of my usual issues that I was ruminating about. I tend to, I tend to overthink. And uh, my main problem really was just that I was overthinking to an uncontrollable extent and, you know, catastrophizing things that were not even really problems. But then on the third day there, when we were, we were just walking around the city uh, in Barcelona, and I just became unable to stand up for more than, you know, a minute at a time, just the most overwhelming fatigue. Like I've run many miles or done, you know, three, four hour workouts that did not feel even remotely close to this. And it was just as tired it was like not having slept in a week, but just being hit with that all of a sudden. And we decided to stay on the trip. I wasn't getting worse, but it wasn't going away either. And there was really no indication as far as what was wrong. Um, we ended up going to the second half of the trip was in Amsterdam. I spent most of that in a hotel bed, just kind of tired. And it seemed easier to just lay down and deal with that versus changing the flights and having to deal with all of that. So the trip ended, we got back home and I didn't get any better. I started going to the doctor. I mean, if it feels, it's hard to remember how often I was going to different doctor's visits, but it felt like every day, it was at least a few times a week, just being checked for everything. Um, and September and October and some of November went by and there was just no indication of what this was. Um, I mean, many things got ruled out. So, uh, a small amount of clarity, but as far as what was actually wrong with me, uh, yeah, it was completely unclear. So this just was an untreated problem for quite a while. And during this time, I couldn't exercise. I was just too tired. I couldn't really do anything. Um, I was at my parents' house. I just, you know, basically stayed in bed. Uh, I was, I guess, still dabbling in sports betting at this time. So that, that was occupying a lot of what I was doing. And, you know, I would just watch TV or movies and kind of do nothing and just be I don't know. I was feeling a lot of emotions, sad and angry mostly, but 
it, confusion was maybe even above both of those. So eventually we were able to have a doctor figure out what was wrong with me. And what had happened was, or what had likely happened was I was forming a blood clot in like my spleen abdominal area for some unknown amount of time. And the overseas flight had probably triggered it where it hit the point where it was like closed off. And that's where the symptoms started. Um, and what they were able to figure out was this stemmed from a blood disorder that I don't think I was born with, but some gene mutation at some point in my life had prompted this and it was symptom free for forever until this happened. There was no concern about there was minimal concern that this would be something that could like shorten my life or whatever. I wasn't really thinking like that, but the symptom that I was dealing with, which is the main symptom of it is just overwhelming fatigue and exhaustion. And this is just, you know, what other people have this condition. This is what they report. There really, there wasn't much that they thought they could do for it. It's just kind of uh, the, the quote I kept hearing is like, this is the new normal, which is funny. This started to, become what people said in 2020 about other things. But for me, you know, this is what I was trying to understand was how to acclimate to this new normal. It's hard to remember just how hopeless I actually was. Like it feels a certain way in hindsight, but I mean, it was, it was substantial. Like I kind of feel like I tend to downplay it a bit now, like, oh, it wasn't that bad. I've called this the best thing that's ever happened to me just because of what it produced after the fact, you know, the gratitude for being where I am now. But at the time, like this was, this felt impossible to deal with. I would, I had this, this would happen, I don't know, probably November, December where, you know, I knew what I had, but wasn't do able to do anything about it really um i would sit there in my room and you know, i was playing a lot of video games i would kind of like stare at the playstation and just imagine like ripping it off the shelf and just smashing it onto the floor just to it was like this weird fantasy of just causing destruction to like vi just get the get the emotions out of my body. Uh, I, I mean, I never actually did that, but I definitely broke some stuff in the house just for no reason. Like nothing would happen and I would just be overcome by this kind of psychological distress and uh, yeah, like take a chair and throw it across the room. Just it's, it's hard even saying these words now to remember the person who behaved that way. Like I just don't, it feels like, it doesn't even feel like another lifetime ago. It does, but on more than that, it feels like another human being. Like I don't, I don't even really know how to relate to that person now. It, it, it feels like it was me, but it kind of wasn't me or at least not anymore. But what ended up happening was, and this is still before the pandemic, we're in February, maybe late February of 2020. And one of the things that had happened is I had actually accepted a job to work for DraftKings uh, in October, and they were holding a spot for me, even though I hadn't started working. So I was trying to go back to work. I hadn't had a real job in, in a while at that point. And four or five months had passed. And I was like, I still can't come in. Like, I'm still too tired. I can't. And maybe that was part of the motivation. But I just, I think more than that. I just got so fed up that I was like, I don't care how much this sucks. I'm going to start working out. And the reason I cared about this so much, um, I think most people know this intuitively, but some people know it, you know, it's literally scientific that one of the best things you can do for your mental health is exercise and specifically, you know, intense cardio is really, really good for that, both psychologically, physiologically, it just makes you feel good after the fact. And that was always my experience. 
until until this happened where the way it would go is i would try to go on like a stationary bike for 15 minutes and i would basically have what i would describe as an allergic reaction to exercising so i would do the bike 15 minutes i would then have to go take like a four hour nap because i couldn't lift my head up so like just a brief amount of exercise would produce like imagine like the worst hangover you've ever had in your life is it was the consequence of just small amounts of exercise so it just you know there was a point where i just given up on that as an idea um I just decided like, this is not worth it. Like, I'm just, you know, maybe another time, but like, there's no way I can keep doing this to myself. But at a certain point, at a certain point, I got so fed up that I was like, I'm just doing this anyway. Um, I don't care if I have to do this <laughs> many, many hour or multi-day downturn after it, I'm just going to do it anyway, because the alternative is not working and I'll just deal with the misery that comes along with it. So I just started doing that. And there was, there, there hit a point. Um, I have this memory. I, I don't remember the date or the, the time really. I just remember watching a 76ers nets game on the TV. Well, I don't know why I sure had money on it, but it was just on. And, uh, I was able to get to like 28 or 32 minutes on the bike or something that was above what I had done. And I don't know, maybe I did like 50 push ups also. And I came upstairs and I was like, this doesn't suck quite as much as it did last time. Like I had done a little bit more and I was feeling bad, but less bad. And it sort of indicated to me, like, okay, there's a small amount of progress happening. Um, and it's crazy. Like I, I never, I never was someone who believed that your feelings actually affected the real world. Um, you know, I, I don't know when I stopped being, it's funny to compare, to like use this as a, <laughs> as a reference point, but like one of the things people knew about me in my early twenties, like my friends would know about me is like, I had just decided I'm an atheist now. Like religion is dumb. You know, I was, I went so extreme. And then similarly within sports, I was like, any psychological variable is unimportant. Like momentum is not a thing. Clutch factors in sports. Like this is, you know, made up nonsense to create narratives on ESPN. I had gone complete from like, someone who thought that every narrative in a sports movie ever was the most powerful thing ever written, you know, that a team coming together is more, more significant than even the talent of the players. I mean, miracle, miracle is a great movie, but, and the story is great, but I, I kind of like over applied that uh, went from there to the complete other side where it was like, there's only hard data and any emotion and feeling like that's just nonsense. You know, it doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters raw facts of the world. And so I wouldn't have been someone who thought that like, if I feel like I'm achieving something that'll actually make me physically healthier. Um, I never would have thought that, but the combination of, you know, podcasts I was listening to and people like Sam Harris and I just, for whatever reason, it kind of clicked like, Oh, I'm, I'm actually getting a little bit better. And then I felt like there was enough in me that said, if you feel like you're doing better, that will make it so you do better. And this, it started to build this upward spiral a little bit. Um, so the next bunch of weeks, I was just doing a little bit more and a little bit more. And the, the suffering would just go a little bit less and a little bit less. Um, and during this time I had also, uh, there was one specific appointment with like an Eastern doctor. Um, I went to Chinatown actually, uh, I think this would have been like the first week in March of 2020. So, um, I got some good advice from this doctor on supplements and lifestyle changes. So I cut out all processed food. 
I started going to bed earlier. I started doing a bit of intermittent fasting. I would eat dinner at five or 6 PM instead of eating in the middle of the night. Like I'd been doing for a while. And I fixed my sleep schedule. I fixed my diet. I I started exercising gradually more and more. And I think I just started getting a little bit animated about the whole project of self-improvement in a way that was totally different from what I had experienced, you know, four or five years before that. Um, Because before the self-improvement was like, I want to be in better shape because I want to be a better athlete. I want to look better physically. So, you know, I'm going to do more bodybuilding. You know, I just want to like look stronger. I, that context is good, but it was nothing compared to this where it was the project was I need to get myself to remain out of bed so I can go back to work and go start living my life. And the, the inflection point was a strange one. I think it's a, it was circumstantial in a way that maybe nothing else in my life ever will be. I, started working again on March 6th of 2020. I was feeling probably 75% of my normal self, but it was good enough that I decided that I could go back part-time. I went back to Hoboken. The office was in Hoboken. My commute to work was a two block walk, like pretty convenient. I was going to be doing four or five hour shifts and I could take like a break in the middle if I needed to. They were very good to me about all of this. And then I was at work for one week, uh, I think just a Monday to a Friday. And the following Monday, they closed the office because of the uh, first case of COVID in professional sports. I think uh, the following Monday was the Rudy Gobert touching all the microphones. And uh, the timing of that was just, I mean, at that point, I had been through so much that the idea of like, I think a previous version of me would have been totally destroyed by this. It's like, I spent six months going from the worst I've ever felt and maybe the worst I'll ever feel to pretty close to normal. And it was by sheer will and brute force. Like I had, wasn't like I'd started taking medicine and it, you know, it made me better. Like I had to make myself better. And then one week after being pretty close to better it was like all right you got to go back stay at home again uh the yeah the lockdown started you know that week and by that time i i just i kind of found the thing the whole thing funny because it just like i i know that it's not i'm not i'm still not someone who believes in fate or anything resembling that but it's hard not to laugh at a situation like that um just the irony of it all. Like, did it really matter that I could get myself back out in the world? You know, now I'm just going to go back home. So what ended up really happening is that this just became more of a reason for me to continue this journey that I was already on. So, you know, I was feeling 75% better. Um, Instead of having to go into an office, now I could just work from home uh, my parents' house has a gym in the basement. I started taking weights out into the garage. You know, we were, we're, this was the time where we were wiping down groceries and no one was going anywhere. There was no possibility of distraction really. Like we were, it was quarantine for the world, uh, at least for those first couple of weeks. And I just, I started working out twice a day because it was like, all right, let's just keep this going. And I started getting really excited about this, like trying to remember what I cared about at the time. Um, The me diving back into sports gambling happened later. I was dabbling, but I wasn't really doing this yet. And then there were no sports during this either. So I think... If I'm remembering it right, March and April had just about nothing. And then maybe in April, there was some international soccer. There was UFC on Saturday nights and there was golf. Uh, Those were the only professional sports being played at all. Uh, Those weren't things I really bet on or know how to bet on. So (laughs) I was going to sleep at like 
10 o'clock, I would wake up at 7 30, 8 in the morning. I would listen to some kind of positive affirmation, some kind of podcast that would put the, that sort of like, I was doing like gratitude journaling and all sorts of stuff like that. Like the most cliche self help stuff that a person can do. I would work out first thing in the morning, do the, you know, the Zoom calls for work, work out again in the middle of the day. Um, I think there were a couple of times I would do a third work. There was just nothing else to do. Uh, and I had become very quickly obsessive about this whole thing. By the time sports came back in, I think it was May, I would have described myself as like 100% better. I think even as that quickly, my flare-ups were an hour, two hours, and they would happen occasionally, but I was fine. Like I was genuinely fine. Um, but we were still stuck at home. So <laughs> I'll come back. I, I mean, I will come back to this. Uh, I didn't want to do this episode. I didn't want to make the first episode about sports betting. This is when it started though, because the, the timing was summer of 2020 sports return. I was feeling well, but we couldn't leave the house. And I just kind of shifted to, I'm just going to be gambling for the next year. Um, so sorry for another time. And, uh, some people listening may know about much of this already, but I certainly will be returning to it. But to fast forward ahead, I ended up moving back to Hoboken in October of 2021. And this is just, <laughs> there's a lot of irony in what's happened to me in the last four years, four or five years. Um, but the first day that I moved back to my apartment, I went to Madison Square Garden and my brother and I saw Joe Rogan do a comedy show. And in case anyone lives under a rock or was living under a rock, Joe Rogan probably did more than almost anyone as far as spreading COVID misinformation. He's one of my favorite people, probably one of my favorite people on earth. Um, I still listen to his podcast. I still think he's, you know, at least a good comedian. And he he was one of the people who was, for better or worse, preaching, you know, taking care of yourself from like a, an individual health perspective, maybe being hesitant about the vaccine. Uh, he had on all sorts of people on his podcast talking about vaccine misinformation. Um, they did require you to be vaccinated to go to the show. Um, I'm sure there were some people with fake vaccine cards. I wasn't one of them. I actually got vaccinated, but I went to the comedy show anyway. Uh, it was the first, it was the first day I was back here and I ended up getting COVID. I mean, I couldn't have gotten it. I couldn't have gotten it anywhere else. I went to the show on a Saturday. I was sick by Monday. There was nothing else I did in that time. I had been at home for the entirety of the previous two years before that. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's no other explanation. So got COVID at the Joe Rogan show and I just figured this is like, okay, a lot of people get COVID. Like not, there's not going to be a problem here. Like I, there was no reason to think that um, my condition would be an issue with, it's not immune system related. So I figured I'd be fine. Um, I was sick for 10, 12 days or something, but it was like having the flu. I was fine after that. And then maybe a day after my symptoms had cleared, I started just getting this like itching sensation all over my body. Nothing that was, I, it was invisible, but just feeling just a sensation completely. And it was manageable, but then there was this one instance where I was still trying to clear out my sinuses a little bit. I took a hot shower for 10, 15, 20 minutes and getting out of the shower, it was the, the worst itching from head to toe that you could possibly feel. And I had no idea where this had come from. 
And this just was not, this happened every single time. Any amount of moisture on my body would just trigger. I, I literally became allergic to water. I'd been allergic to exercise two years prior to this. Something that's very strange to be allergic to. <laughs> this was allergic to any sort of wetness on my body whatsoever. And I, I really, I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, fortunately, it was November at this point. So what I would do was I would take a shower and then I would take off as much clothing as possible and just go stand outside in the freezing cold. And that would at least mitigate the symptoms. Um, then I just started taking cold showers, which were less bad. But obviously, this was untenable. I went to a wedding around this time and had to... I'm pretty sure that I didn't have any food or alcohol for the entire... Th I just had water because I was trying to just limit inflammation as much as possible. And any little thing was potentially triggering. Um, I had to like sit in front of the window for a lot of it just to like make sure I didn't sweat at all. It was arguably it was shorter duration but it was arguably worse than any of the initial illness um what ended up alleviating that was i got on medicine made it go away was able to solve that problem without having to actually do anything myself but the the immediate remedy became a long-term the immediate remedy became the thing that I'm now talking about. So I had never really cared about doing cold showers before that. I had tried them a couple of times, didn't really notice, you know, much change to my life other than the fact that it was very unpleasant and I would feel kind of powerful having done them like, oh, this thing sucked and I did it for three minutes it's just a little bit, it's a little bit empowering to just do something that's hard. That was kind of just full stop. Um, but during this brutal run, which I guess could be classified as long COVID, I don't know. It was like a few weeks of just these crazy symptoms after being sick. I would stand outside shirtless in I don't know, 27, 24 degree weather. Like I, I think I laid in the snow one time, like making like a, like someone would be buried in the sand at the beach. I was doing that with snow just to get as cold as possible to prevent the itching. So winter of that year, spring of 2022, uh, I kind of resumed, I just resumed my regular life. Like the gambling thing was uh, sports betting had taken over a lot of my time, but at least, you know, I was back in my apartment. I was at work. I was, I was busy and I felt pretty good. My exercise routine was good. Everything was pretty much back to normal again. So this was now uh, the second full recovery that seemed like, all right, baseline, we've hit status quo again. I don't have any more things to worry about. What I hadn't realized, and I started to realize this in the summer of 2022, is that because I was home the prior two sum summers, I, I, I had not yet become aware of the other symptom of my condition. So fatigue is the main one. But the second one is that I was, I'd become extremely intolerant to heat and humidity. I was in 2020, I was home inside during, you know, in the air conditioning the whole summer. 2021 was more of the same. I was outside a little bit and maybe, you know, when I was playing golf, I would have some kind of reaction, but I didn't realize it. It was pretty minimal. I just wasn't outside that much. But in summer of 2022, I tried to actually live my life. And, you know, I'd be in Hoboken or worse, New York City with like, you know, the heat radiating off the sidewalk. And I started having these, and this is like, the third, th the third one of these, like an allergic reaction to the weather. Um, and there were many days in that summer where I was just in bed because the heat would create this, the, it would just create the exhaustion more than anything. You know, I was feeling fatigue in relate fatigue as a consequence of being overheated. Um, 
And I know <laughs> this is a thing that anyone can experience, but it was just the normal heat exhaustion, just times 10 all the time, every week, basically. So I basically spent most of that summer just inside. And fortunately, I had found, and you know, this is why I bring up Andrew Huberman. This is why I started the podcast with him. People like him, um, even people like Joe Rogan for, you know, even though he and his audience got me COVID. Whether they're the experts or they're just interviewing experts, I had internalized enough medical information that's actually real and useful. Um, Peter Atia, also one of the one of my favorite people to listen to. I forget which of them is the one who had given me this idea, but I had gotten it in my head that I could train myself on heat exposure. So that winter, I bought a sauna blanket. I think the first thing I did was I started running the stairs in my building in, I want to say it was like two sweatshirts and two pairs of sweat. Like I'd stack the sweatshirts on top of each other and I'd wear multiple layers of sweatpants, multiple layers of socks, a ski hat, like just get as warm as humanly possible and run the stairs for one to three hours consecutively just totally insane behavior, but it was like, let me get myself overheated when I can deal with it because, you know, I'd get overheated and then I would just go outside and be snowing and I could recover from it much quicker because, you know, in the summer, I, you obviously can't do that. The heat's everywhere in the winter, much less of a problem. So that winter, that's what I started doing. I bought a sauna blanket, like basically a sleeping bag that you can just lay in and it just cooks you. Um, almost as good as being in a real sauna. I would sometimes drive in the car and just blast the heat as much as possible. And I don't know, I was basically recreating what a sauna is. I had never actually done a real sauna before at that point, but I was trying to, I don't know, I guess I could have just gone to a real one, just lack of knowledge at the time. And I didn't know if this worked, but by last year, so summer of 2023, when it started getting hot again, I almost didn't realize because I think I had actually somewhat successfully acclimated myself to the heat by doing this. And then once I realized, and it was kind of similar to the exercise thing, when I finally got back into that, it was like, oh, this is working. I'm just going to become obsessed with this. And I started going to saunas all the time. Summer just ended now. Clearly, like this past summer, I had almost no problems with this. Uh, it's almost not even a consequence anymore. So who knows if that'll continue. But the point of sharing all this is you kind of, there's a benefit from the quote I read all the way at the beginning. There's a benefit to just doing stuff that is challenging without really any knowledge of whether it is directly useful. In retrospect, I can see that there's a cause and effect. Like I did certain actions that were hard and some of them had direct benefits where, you know, like physiologically, my body was able to be in a better place because of something I had done. But I feel like all of these things kind of, they layer together because I was able to go into the gym when it seemed impossible and when it felt impossible, every, every subsequent impediment just became less and less problematic. So when I couldn't work out, like I really couldn't, and I did it anyway, and just forced myself to do it anyway. And internalize the knowledge that that is something that can be done. Like this was by far the hardest. My life's been generally pretty easy. This is by far the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with. It, it set something in my brain. And then, you know, at some point I heard Andrew Huberman say it and it kind of clicked. So I would say the combination of the experience of having lived that of doing something that I thought was actually impossible and just doing it anyway and it working. And then having someone with the actual expertise say the mechanism, whether it's fully true or not, that, that you, there's an actual brain area that grows based on your 
ability to do something you don't want to do, whether that's actually true or not, just the concept, because I felt it in reality, but just to have someone contextualize it for me, I think those two things mixed together, it was very informative when subsequent things have happened. So every, the next challenge and the next challenge and the next challenge, they've been, they've all felt easier to deal with relative to the prior ones. And I think, I think this can be simulated. I think that you can subject yourself to hard things for no reason and become the kind of person who one feels comfortable dealing with them when they happen because difficult situations are always going to happen. Even, even if there's something actually difficult, your brain will create, create some kind of mess. You know, there's the per, the cliche of the person where everything is great. Their life is perfect, but why doesn't anything mean anything to me? You know, I'm still no, no, everything seems so dull and boring. Like you become depressed if life's there's always going to, the point is there's always going to be a problem of some kind. So I think that you can subject yourself to difficult things proactively and just prepare your mind and your physical brain to be able to deal with them when they come. I think, you know, this is why I'm calling this podcast, not that cold. I think the cold exposure is as perfect of a metaphor for this as there is. You look at ice cold water and no matter how many times you've done it, unless you're literally Wim Hof, but maybe even him, no matter how many times you've done it, you look at this thing, whether it's a cryo chamber or a ice bath or whatever. And you say, there, there's no way I'm getting in that. Like part of your brain just is like, this is terrible. I'm not doing it. And then you make yourself do it anyway. And you realize it was never, it was never that cold to begin with. Like it's actually, most things are not as bad as you think they are um, past the initial first layer. Like those first 10 seconds, they're brutal every time. But once you're in there, it's like, I did the hard part. And objectively, it might be just as hard, but subjectively, it's like, I've already, I've already taken the leap. I'm already here. So I might as well stick it out for a bit. And I think doing that repetitively is, it sets your mind in a place where you kind of want to do that with many things. But I think it probably is true that there's a physical change in brain chemistry that just makes you more competent at doing anything that you deem as challenging in just about any other context. So is it better to have something real happen and learn from that? Like, I think the reason I'll say that getting sick is the best thing to ever happen to me is because as, as visceral of a sensation as being in ice water is having to deal with something at that scale, like a real physical challenge for months at a time is like you just you can't really recreate that but i think you can kind of dose yourself with that periodically and you know get the benefit get most of the benefit with not quite as much suffering um so when when i proceeded to have these subsequent challenges when uh my whole body was itching for what seemed like no reason when I realized that I had a problem dealing with heat and humidity, I just, the, the amount of time that it took for me to go from dread to just acceptance and then hope that I could change it because there was still dread, but each subsequent thing, the dread, the duration of it has just diminished slightly and slightly and slightly. Um, this past it was only a month ago, actually, that this happened. I was in Denmark and I maybe a combination of the the heat and the bad food I was eating because you know, my diet's not quite as strict as it was before. And being on vacation, it's harder to manage that um, and not sleeping as much because you're traveling. I had a day where I was just the fatigue came back and the first 20 minutes of it was like pure dread. And then I kind of, you know, I was ruminating, like, am I going to have to cut this trip short? Am I going to have to fly home? Is this, is all of this returning is, you know, am I going to just go back to being sick? Like there's just catastrophizing in the brain, but I got from that to just, this will be fine. Like 
this has happened before. You know how to deal with this. Just rest. It'll go away. Like, let's not make everything into this whole mess. Let's not project into the future. Just sit with it. You know how to deal with this stuff. This is my self-talk. I, I ended up being fine three hours later. I, my reaction to that could have been a lot worse. I mean, I'll, I'll just kind of say that like I, one, I know how to deal with that specific category of problem now, but on the other part of it is like, okay, here's another challenge. Let's just face the challenge. Um, you sort of build, and this is kind of what I think ties it all together. You sort of build a propensity for the, the mindset shift, the, there's kind of like a, and this will make some people laugh. There's a momentum in problem solving. You have a challenge, you overcome it. You have a challenge, you overcome it. You have a challenge, you overcome it. And then you sort of over time become the kind of person where it's like bad thing. Okay. I can, you know, use that. I can get, there's this, there's this video um, from Jocko Willink where he's like talking about how there's this guy, he was in the military with and the guy would be like Jocko you're just going to say good no matter what I say um, and it's both motivational but also just very amusing because he's describing like every you know breaking a leg and not getting a job and like things that are things that are bad he's just like good like you can you can just learn from that um, and I think it's a bit of a it's a bit of like a caricature of the idea but there is truth to it like if you just start reframing things as opportunities to grow part of your brain will know like, okay, this is silly. Like th these things are objectively bad, but another part of your brain will actually believe it. And it actually makes you more capable of resisting rumination and overcoming the problem thing, thing that's bad happened. Okay. Let's go. Another thing to deal with. So this whole podcast, I think what I'm trying to do is find the value in the the hard thing in as many contexts as I can. So in the past, that would have been, you know, how do you recover from like a week or a month or whatever, like a bad run in gambling or getting injured and learning how to navigate an injury. And, you know, there's like the story of, I think there's a summer where like Kobe Bryant broke his right hand and he got really good at dribbling with his left hand because he had the injury, like stuff like that. I think that's, that's kind of the sweet spot for me right now. And I want to also embody that in the stuff I talk about. So I could have started with, you know, a sport. I could have just talked about Kobe for a whole episode, but it just felt more relevant to and maybe a little strange, but more relevant to just give my entire backstory of why I kind of am where I am now and just start there, even though it admittedly feels a little bit awkward. It's a little bit weird to be talking into a green dot on my computer and not actually talking to another person. But, you know, it's not that cold. So. Until next time.